Okay, not that's well. happy to have you here today. We're about to start the show, Ray. Welcome to Amy's Art Cabaret. Yay! Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Welcome back, people who've watched this before and new people. Oh, we already have people in the chat. Hi, hi, Kathina. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone watching. Yay! Um, today, Barb is here with me again. Barb, how did your project from last week go? I have a feeling that you got pretty far when we were off screen. Yeah, so so like I was cutting all of the pieces to be layered up in the 3D um, 3D globe. Um, and uh, I did manage to um, put holes in them and I put them on a string. I strung them through in the middle and have a bead at the bottom and a bead at the top. And then like just fishing line. So I like this. This is kind of a neat little globe thing. Look at that. That is cool. The, the fun thing about it, the extra fun thing about it is that I hung it from the ceiling um, and I just had it because I wanted to, you know, just hang it somewhere for, for now because I'm out of the way. Yeah. Paint it or put beads or you know, add some more stuff to it. Right. Um, my cat Solo, who likes to come jump up on the desk, decided that this is the best toy ever. Uh oh, I think you oh. have a marketing thing, plan I know. here. I'm like, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess this is your toy now and I'll make a new one. Oh, but yeah. I that's perfect. Right. If only we could throw it at Jean. Jean, can we throw this at you so you could practice with your cats? <laughs> I'll catch it in my mouth. <laughs> perfect. And mine, I, as you can see, I didn't finish yet, but I've cut out all the circles, so I'm getting a step closer. Um, and still have my marionette. I wanted to uh, introduce our special guest today, Jean. Jean wrote a book and is an amazing artist. And Jean, how... How do I even know you? Oh, we had shows together in Jersey City. I think Can Cold Lost, wasn't it? Weren't we in that show at Can Cold Lost? Before we were in, in a bunch of, yes, yes. And we were also um, in Union City. We were in a bunch of shows together. We were in a newspaper in Spanish, in black and white. Oh and yeah, we I remember were... that. <laughs> uh, you, okay. you were... Oh, Joe, it's called Cambrio. I can't remember the name of the new Yeah. Still but it was, it was I'll think fun. of it in a minute and then I'll close it out. You were, you were all dapper in your black shirt, and I was wearing an off white shirt. And then they took the pictures, and it was a black and white newspaper. And I stuck out more than you just because it was white. <laughs> I remember that. And uh -huh. so here you are today wearing a white shirt. <laughs> I wear a lot of white shirts. Oh, well, you know, no. very, I was going to wear a jacket too, but in case like anybody asks to see my work, I have a self-portrait where I'm wearing a white shirt and a black jacket. So I didn't want to just look like my portrait. So, <laughs> but I only iron this much in my shirt because that's all that shows when you wear a jacket. Oh yeah, that's, that's true. That's the trick I commonly pull is to only iron this part of my shirt. Is that what you did today? Because we can only see that much of you on video. Oh, unless, unless so this started. part isn't too wrinkled, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Anything from here over, from, from here to here was not ironed. Only this part in the middle was ironed. <laughs> I don't have the energy. That's all right. It's all right. I don't, I don't think I even ironed anything today. So don't worry. So, um, so you're, you're working on some self-portraits or you did a self-portrait? I did a self-portrait in a demo in a class a couple of years ago. And, um, I had, the thing is, I spent so long writing the book, I haven't done hardly any artwork. I'm only getting back to it like now. I did a few paintings for Christmas presents, things like that. But mostly I've been working on the book um, for eight years. And, um, wow. oh yeah, yeah, I had no idea. I started, the book was supposed to be to promote that six hour art major class that I taught, that I teach still, you know, and, um, because originally that class was going to be a business seminar. And they, I read something that said, oh, if you have a seminar, you should have something to sell with it, like, you know, an audio, a book, something. I said, oh, I could take a year and write a book. And then before <laughs> I knew it, it was like eight years. Oh, and, my God. <laughs> uh, so I haven't done any artwork at all. And the self-portrait I did in one of my classes as a demo. And... Um, it was kind of embarrassing actually, because here I am, I hadn't painted in so long that the portrait didn't look anything like me until I brought it home and finished it. And I had to like, 
Well, you're working in oil paint, right? For that? This particular one's in oil, yeah. Yeah, so that takes longer anyway. Yeah, but even still, it was like I made my nose too short. So I had to lower everything on the portrait. Like my mouth had to be lower, my chin had to be lower, my neck had to be longer, the collar had to move down. So everything from here down had to, so I'm kind of like this instead of like this. <laughs> um, but just cut off the top of the uh, of the canvas. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, just cut the top of the canvas. Cut off the canvas and then just start cut the top again. Of the canvas. Yeah. <laughs> I could have done that. Yeah, but no, I I just wound up. It, it's okay. It just like looks makes me look like I'm leaning a little more for far farther forward than I actually am. Well, with your uh, all the research you did with art, do you think artists' self portraits historically look accurate? I mean, how do we know that? We don't. We absolutely don't. As a matter of fact, I think most self-portraits throughout history have been to flatter people. And that's something I'm going to get into. Well, I'm going to do a little reading for the book that's maybe about 10 minutes long as we talk. Thank you. Yay. Cool. Okay. And yeah. then we have some more. We have a lot of people on chatting and saying hi to Jean. They're all looking forward to this. They're here already. So here, hi. <laughs> hi. everybody. I can't see anybody who's here, just so you know. That's all right. We can't either. I just see them in the chat room, and that's that's where it is. And then this will live on YouTube, so they can all watch us later again if they oh, missed it. Yeah, it's going to be archived forever and ever and ever. Or they just want to see Gene again. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I'm saying, but about the portraits is that yep. that's one thing. I'm going to read about Lucian Freud and his portraits of people, but for most of history, the idea was to present the person who is usually some elevated king, queen, something you know, at their best, you know, and you had to show them looking as good as possible. So we have no idea. And also come to think of it, it depends on the portraitist because some portraitists did very realistic portraits that really caught the person, but then other ones just kind of painted generic sort of faces. And like a lot of portraits of Marie Antoinette, I don't think you could necessarily recognize her walking down the street because she looked kind of generic in most of her portraits. She didn't really look like a specific person. Mm -hmm. So that's another part of it, I think. Yeah, that's that's true. I would think so. Barb, do you have any self-portraits of yourself that you've done recently? I did a self-portrait in oh, Barb. yesterday. I don't have yesterday. it with me. Oh, I might have a picture, but no, no. I'm gonna do a quick one yesterday right now. at camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Legos, you got Legos right there on your desk. I do not. That was one of our things. The know. funny thing about self portraits is everybody thinks like they're they're so honest. Like, oh, the self portrait is the most revealing kind of portrait you can do. And then, you know, the thing is, it's totally posed. Self portraits are the, probably the least honest painting there is because the artist is trying to present their image as they want the world to see them. So the idea that self portrait is especially honest is like total BS. Like like selfies, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, or, oh, I'm gonna throw out those hundred that didn't work. Yeah, you know, I don't want anybody to know what I really look like. You know, you don't, don't think it's, huh? This is you and and me, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> this is us right now. I don't know why you have a beret on, but you do. <laughs> I can't really wear a beret. In the I took an art class in France once, and I did wear a beret. I tried on with a real French berets, like the real thing. And I just don't look good in a beret. So mm. it's not a good look for me. Interesting. It, cut, it cuts the it top off not, my head and makes me look like this big face. You just got to do a self portrait with it, and then you'll be fine. Oh, yeah. And then I can make it flattering. Yeah. And then everyone will think through history oh, this that guy is great in a beret. Why don't I have a beret on right now? <laughs> the thing is, there's too many photographs to tell the truth. It's really funny, there's a, a portrait Edgar Degas did of himself. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and Corbet too. Corbet did a self-portrait where he looks like Johnny Depp. He didn't look <laughs> like Johnny Depp. Because after the Impressionists, there's photographs of the artists. Prior to the Impressionists, there's no photographs of what the artists really look like. So we have no idea what they really look like. That's but with true. the Impressionists on, like Edgar Degas did not look anything like his self-portraits. Uh, Gustave Courbet did not look anything like Johnny Depp. There <laughs> photographs of him. So it's like, who are you kidding? You know, there's photographs to tell the truth. I think I look a little bit like uh, Annette. <laughs> a little, you know, just a little. It's just, it's just, that's a little narrower, though. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite a perfect sphere. It's true. <laughs> my head is not a perfect sphere. And Annette is not my self-portrait. It's true. Oh, who's Annette? This is Annette, Mary Annette. Oh, I didn't say hi to Jean. Hi, Mary Annette's- um... Oh, Mary, oh, Annette. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Annette. Mary Annette. Oh, he <laughs> we have a lot of uh, friends on this show. Um, they're friends that Barb and I have made through the years, sometimes literally, other times just puppets I have around. That looks like Grover. It is. It's uh, Grover. Oh, okay. It's a very old. Um, like rubber, I think it's from the 70s. I feel like I'm standing in Times Square. <laughs> Milton is here. Oh, Milton, Milton is here. Milton's, uh, Milton's back is doing a weird thing though right now. He's having it's some back the, pain? Yeah, it's it's the rubber bands. They can dance pretty well though. Oh, Make sure, it's cool though. Hmm? Make sure Gene knows why he's named Milton. He's named Milton because this is from a box of, of Milton crackers, which you can't see. Uh, I don't think I have an actual thing, but his it name says is Milt. Oh, okay. this, is made, this is made from cardboard, from paperboard, from um, from a box of crackers. And his head's a cracker. And his head's <laughs> a cracker. I don't know if it's like this for the rest of the world, Barb, but to me, you're kind of low. Uh, right. Am I too low? No. Do I have That's to just like, I just have to have my micro, my face in my microphone all the time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thanks, so, yeah. I'll just but, do that. We're your, photo, okay. we're your photogenic. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> Nobody's worried about anything here. Well, so Milton's Jean, very cute, so, you know. Oh, that's nice. Milton, but you got a compliment. Going, he's going away. <laughs> so you do a lot of projects with people. I teach them how to make art, and that's like kind of one of your main issues, right? Are you involved in that too, Barbara? I am. Because I see Barb makes things. Yeah. I, I, I do, yes. Things, specifically things. things. Yeah, people say <laughs> that I make stuff, but that's not accurate. Uh, nor I items, things. just things. I, I do. I do a wide stuff variety. items and things. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, there is. <laughs> okay. If you go to YouTube.com/slash Barb Makes Things, you'll see the difference between things, stuff, and items. Seriously? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good. Because we don't yeah. ever want to be too serious, do we? No, no. no. And speaking no. of serious, you remind me, Barb, I forgot to show off my paper earrings. I made these years ago, um, but they started, there are three pieces, each of them. Mm -hmm. They started to yellow. So this morning I started coloring them in with markers and I colored my bird in. Oh, it's hard to see right now, but um, yeah. And then Barb makes things. See, there's another thing for you to see, uh, Jean. Oh, it's, uh, it's crown. Very, mm, it's hard it's, to get it just right. A there. crown that's not operating correctly how could this a crown is, not operate correctly huh it's 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 i mean it's a lot of pieces i need to do some more stuff. what are they are they cut out circles or they're bottle caps. no they're bottle caps bottle caps they're Did bottle you smash caps. them down i i hammered them out i punched holes in them and then i used a pop riveter to attach oh. them together do you know el anatsui that the artist from ghana do you know him amy yes look him up he does these He's a, an artist from Ghana and he does these huge curtains out of like metal things, like pieces of evaporated milk cans and smashed up bottle caps and things like that. And makes these enormous curtains out of them, almost like chain mail. Gene, sure. do you, um, do you uh, when you're making art, if you start making art again? <laughs> I do, I am, I'm painting. I, I'm yeah, yeah. actually working on a set of surrealist tarot cards right now. Oh, that sounds really cool. Yeah, I could show you one of them. Actually, why don't we advance to the slide here? Oh, well, we yeah. Gotta share your screen. This is my self-portrait that I yeah, use. Your your and screen then this is my, my my tarot card of the tower. <laughs> we have you a guest in the room. Can everybody in the world see this? You need step to step back your screen again. Yeah. You do you have to share your screen again, nope. Gene. <laughs> oh, I'm not we're amazing. all imagining these things. They, they look amazing. <laughs> you just can't screen. see them. They do. They look really good. Okay, wait. I'm sharing my screen. So, share. Are you? Oh, go. yeah. Okay, let's share. Okay. There oh, there we are for a second. Woo! You okay, so let me make this full screen. Now, the problem is now I can't see anybody. 
So this uh, is my self portrait that I did about four years ago or so, three years ago, maybe two years, I don't know. And then this is my tarot card, the tower. Oh. And it basically with tarot, with tarot cards. Mm -hmm. Are these gonna be, are the tarot cards gonna be for sale on your website? Oh yeah, eventually. The thing is I have only like six of them done and there's 22 to do. That's all right. <laughs> we can do pre-order. Pre it's a work in progress. Yeah. True. So we'll see. But they take forever to do because, um, let me escape. I want to see people again. They take see? forever oh. to do because everyone is like just kind of an experiment. Mm -hmm. So I never know what medium they're going to be in. There are all kinds of mediums. And I don't know what they're going to look like. And sometimes I do each one over like probably six or seven times before I finally do one I like. Nice. So sometimes I spend like weeks on one and then something goes wrong and I have to throw it out. And I do another one. You know, I basically kind of sketch it over again from a template. And what, if, what if I take the one you throw out and make something out of it? Well, you, the thing is, usually I use the paper to experiment on. Awesome. Okay, okay. good. You keep doing I was, stuff. Yes, yeah, so I, I keep doing say, stuff like, like, yeah. so I can, um, you know, like experiment with whatever mediums I want to on the other side of the paper. Perfect. Or the paper is left. Barb and I throw nothing out, so that's why we were asking. Say, yeah. <laughs> also, I love showing the process of things, so I would be inclined to hang on to the ones that don't actually make it. So you can say like, here is the process of creating this. This is not, you know, my first one that, you know, I did this and it was instantly perfect. And, but you have like, you have the artifacts, you have the documentation that shows that this, you know, was a, a whole. No, mine are so poor, I have to throw them out. And the thing <laughs> is, I just basically put a piece of, um, of um, transfer paper under the, the, the drawing, because I have the original drawing and I put transfer paper on it and just, trace it onto a new piece of watercolor on the watercolor block. Because these okay. are uh, watercolor paper. Nice. So, you know, I just trace it again, and then I use the old ones to experiment on. So there's no point in saving them. You know, there's nothing to be saved. There's nothing to be saved. Nothing to be saved. They're just hard. Barb's shaking her head no, Unless but... you took a picture. See, I'm coming at it from the educator's point of view where you have something that's not that great. And that's an excellent thing to inspire younger people who are like, who are like, oh my gosh, my stuff looks horrible. And it's like, no, everybody's stuff looks horrible until it looks good. What do you I have one of my, oh, I'm sorry. What was that? What you, my self-portrait looks great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm, but I'm really, I'm not the kind for a beret, really. I don't even yeah. know what kind of hat to wear anymore. No, one of my students actually does these amazing kind of heads that she just kind of makes up. Sometimes she uses a, a photograph and kind of takes off from it. And I said, do you ever do any bad paintings? So she sent me some of her bad paintings. They were truly awful, <laughs> uh, but then she reworked them and they came out really well. Um, oh, cool. But, I'm, I'm more the John Singer Sargent kind of thing. John Singer Sargent destroyed all his bad work. I say a lot of the greats did, yeah. Yeah, so there are no bad sergeants because he just he just ripped them all up and threw them out or burned them or something. Yeah. And I'm kind of of that school. If something stinks, it's like, let them think I did very few excellent works rather than a whole lot of crap. Well, at least for Barb and I, when you decide to burn all your old oil paintings, we're not going to be downwind of you because it's going the other way. <laughs> It'll be fine by the time it gets to the West Coast. <laughs> the air. <laughs> Most of them just rip up, you know, wow. and I just kind of throw them That's out. Good. good, good. So, cool. so Jean, do you want to pull up your uh, screen so you can t do a reading for us? Because I'm really looking forward to this. All right, sure. And then we can talk about uh, afterwards how to pre-order your book or order it now if it's ready. Um, and what they can do. Because you were supposed to go on a book reading tour, weren't you? Actually, I had a bunch of dates planned. Uh, there was I was supposed to do a thing at 92nd Street Y. Mm -hmm. I was probably going to do a thing at this place called Local Westport, which is an art space up in Connecticut. And both of those went belly up. There was also something in Princeton I was planning on doing, and they're closed. So... Uh, the only thing I might have planned is 
right now word bookstore in jersey city said to contact them in the winter because they might be interested in doing something but right now there's very little planned as far as promoting the book and i'm not sure exactly what i can do i'm trying to get as much as possible yeah yeah that's understandable hold, you so know. is this your first book reading this so is this, book? this will be my first actual i think it will actually the first thing i've done to promote the book yay barb so and i are honored <laughs> Good. yeah Good. we're very excited let her, you... crown, Barbara. let her put it on her head because she should be honored to be my first reading ever <laughs> oh exclusive reading <laughs> we just like to make sure everyone knows how uh, uh honored and we're very, very excited. Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, as, as so you should be. <laughs> see how everyone listening. We have a whole chat room full of people. So yay, cool. Yay. Yeah. I hope everybody's back there applauding. So, they are. <laughs> actually, so can I talk about what the book is about? I guess. Oh yeah, tell us what it's about before you start reading this. Like, okay, that are. <laughs> done. Okay, go on. <laughs> actually, it is kind of done because it is basically about art. The whole idea is, well, when you and I went to JCC that time together looking for work, that was after I got fired from my day job mm -hmm. because I didn't get fired, I got laid off because I was doing property management, the building got sold, it's a long story. So I kind of reinvented myself to start teaching and uh, I thought I was gonna do that six hour art major class as a business seminar and that's why I started writing the book in the first place and then it turned into something else. But six hour art major is basically the idea is that you go to art school for six hours and so you can understand what it's like to be an artist, <laughs> you know? And because you've gone to art school and you do some drawing exercises, you go through art history, art appreciation, all that kind of stuff. And then the point of the book is just to explain art in general. That's why I can actually say it's about art because it tries to explain all the questions people have about art, like why is art so expensive? Where, why do we do art? What's the purpose of art? Yeah, so, why, why are you charging so much for your art when it only takes you two seconds to make it? <laughs> yeah, and that's true. And it's like, well, you don't ask that of a doctor, do you? When a doctor charges you $250 to talk to you for 10 minutes, you know, we just don't question the fact that they have all this experience behind them. It's the same thing with the artists. Like, it costs like a lot of money to go to art school, you know. And you think you have at least, you know, if you get a master's degree, you have like six years of training that costs a whole lot of money to get. And you know, even it, it, that's what allows you to do a drawing in twenty minutes or yeah. however long it takes is the fact that you have years and years of training behind you. Exactly. So what the book explains: art history, the history of the museum the finances of art, what what it, what it to look for when you look at a painting, all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it covers ba all the basic questions, but it's also aimed for people who are artists because in eight years of research, uh, I learned so much about art that I think even people who know about art already are gonna lot, learn a lot more than they knew to begin with, because I oh. learned a lot. So that's basically it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's it, you've read the whole book already. <laughs> and okay. before you start reading, I just want you to know you have a comment on here already from Ruth saying that the six hour art major is very worthwhile. So yay, thank you. Thank for you, Ruth. Your... I know who Ruth is. She's yeah. one of my painting students and she's very accomplished herself. So let me return the compliment. Awesome. I'm glad Ruth is listening in. Okay. So, you ready? You you ready to share your... Yeah, you ready to share your screen? I am. I'm sharing my screen right now. I'm going to go okay, full we're screen. Bring it stream. Hold on. Here you go. Yay. Okay, everyone. Okay. So I don't know if people are seeing me. All I see is my book cover. Uh, but this is the cover of the book. The book is supposed to theoretically come out September 15th, but with the COVID, we don't know. On Amazon, it says October 4th. On the Roman and Littlefield website, it says September 15th, so I have no idea. But the section we're going to read is from chapter eight. Chapter eight is called the 13 or so traits of creative people according to me. And so it's basically a survey of the characteristics and work habits that all artists share most of the time. And what I'm going to read is trait number six, which is sensitivity. 
Okay, so this is one of the traits that most artists, all artists share most of the time. So, <clears throat> let me have a sip of my coffee. Okay, trait number six, sensitivity. When artists aren't being described as starving or so-called, they're usually described as sensitive. The sensitive artist can often be spotted leaping through meadows, strewing flowers and spouting poetry, or alternately walking along the boulevard of broken dreams, draped in black, the back of their head perpetually pressed against their forehead. They find beauty in art where others do not, much in the way that dogs can hear sounds inaudible to humans. The profound depth of their appreciation for beauty and art is matched only by the profound depth of their passions. Well, yeah, if you're watching the miniseries. Sensitivity, as it applies to art, is not contingent on maintaining an operatic lifestyle, nor does it intrinsically imply being sensitive toward others. Edgar Degas was an anti-Semite, Benvenuto Cellini, a murderer, the fat futurists, fascists. It has to do with awareness. A keen sense of observation is a prerequisite for the job, seeing versus looking. We all recognize facial expressions, artists have to analyze them. They need to detect all the colors in a glass of water and calculate the exact angle at which the side of a hill slopes. If they find inspiration in the configuration of a seed pod or the arrangement of colors in the cereal aisle, it's because they know where other artists have found it. If they have a greater understanding of art, it's because they've been there and done it. An artist can discern the variety, subtlety, and complexity of art, like a chef can discern those qualities in food. Uh, let's see, where's the little arrow? Okay. This was supposed to be the slide I was showing you for sensitivity. While I was what? reading that section, I was supposed to be showing you that slide, and I neglected to. I missed my cue. Sorry, folks. Anyway, now I'm going to read about Lucian Freud. Beyond visual acuity, there's a type of sensitivity, sensitivity that goes beneath the surface to capture the subject's essence or beyond it to add a layer of meaning. One famous portrait artist had the perfect last name for someone sensitive enough to do both. Throughout history, and this is what we were talking about earlier, the aim of nearly all portraiture has been to flatter, dignify, or aggrandize some personage of elevated rank, thereby crafting an enduring image of the individual as well as the office. Physical flaws were minimized, facial expressions absent, deformity and shows of emotions were sh reserved for the lower classes. Popes, kings, empresses, heiresses, captains of industry, and college presidents assumed a generic air of nobility appropriate to their position, the trappings of which surrounded them. They still make official portraits like this to put up in the White House, but modern portraiture has gone way past ancestors and heads of state standing next to flags. Lucian Freud, grandson of the father of psychoanalysis, lived in London until his death in 2011 at age 88, his parents having settled there after fleeing Berlin the year Hitler took power. He earned widespread acclaim for his portraits and figure paintings and no small notoriety as a bad boy. Rumor has it he burned down one of his art schools with a carelessly tossed cigarette, or at least took credit for it, not to mention his patho as a pathological lothario. He fathered 14 verifiable children, many of whom remained unaware of their half-siblings for years by six different women. Despite having fond recollection of the man himself, he claimed to have little patience for his grandfather's theories and found their emphasis on sex amusing. That didn't prevent him, however, from submitting his models, with whom more often than not he was already acquainted, sometimes intimately, to a relentless visual third degree lasting hundreds of hours, matter-of-factly documenting their every imperfection, blemish, and discoloration. It may be the most honest human flesh ever rem rendered. Then he went deeper. Even as he smeared more and more pigment onto the canvas, he stripped away more and more of the superficial. Whoever posed for him is almost invariably caught in a moment when they appear utterly exposed, vulnerable even, whether from having so much time for introspection or having been looked at for so long that their guard was down and pretense was no longer possible, or Lucian having inherited more from Sigmund than he thought or cared to admit. They seemed lost in thought, pondering some great question, perhaps coming to some great realization. It could be that they come to see themselves as Freud does, with the implicit understanding that as they're being immortalized, so is their mortality. The artist was no less uncompromising later in his career when he was painting the likes of fashion model Kate Moss and the Queen of England was his subject. As you can probably imagine, 
the queen comes across nothing like she does in all those official coronation portraits in the 1950s. A genuinely visual visionary artist sees what no else one let me start that line again. A genuinely visionary artist sees what no one else does. They not, may not be thought of as artists or think of themselves that way, such is the case with many outsider artists. Their visions can spring from bouts of insanity, religious euphoria, or psychoactive drugs. Looking at their art is like reading an intimate biography. Though these artists have experiences most of us never will, they're only doing what any other artist does, sharing their reality. They're generally incapable of creating during their altered states of consciousness. Those with manic depression may not have the focus when they're manic or the motivation when they're depressed. Those in the throes of religious experiences have their minds elsewhere. It is possible to create under the influence, however, if you don't have too many expectations. Brian Lewis Saunders decided to investigate. He's been doing a self-portrait every single day since March 30th, 1995. By now, he's created well over 7,000. In 2012, he decided to dedicate 50 portraits in a row to 50 different drugs, from absinthe to Zyprexa, used in the treatment of bipolar disorder. He was able to produce a recognizable likeness after drinking two bottles of cough syrup, vaping concentrated hashish resin, and inhaling lighter fluid, although predictably the mood of each piece varies considerably. On the other hand, bath salts, the headline drug of 2012, spawned a nightmarish mutant creature perpetrated in a frenzied sprawl. You have to wonder how drunk this very accomplished and resilient artist had to be that all he could manage for alcohol was a disorderly pink and black scribble. Here's my little arrow here, there we go. Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night from 1889 may seem too obvious a choice for a talk about visionary art. But so often has this image been seen, there are Starry Night teapots, socks, and flip-flops, and its story been told in books, movies, operas, symphonies, pop songs, and one man's show starring Leonard Nimoy, that it's easy to forget how unsettling this picture is and the sad story behind it. Van Gogh painted his iconic masterpiece a month after having himself voluntarily confined at the St. Paul Asylum in saint Remy de provence France. Six months had passed since he'd sliced off his entire right ear with a razor, distraught over falling out with his housemate, housemate fellow artist Paul Gauguin. His grisly act of self-mutilation had nearly killed him. One year later, while living in the Paris suburb of auvers sur he would commit suicide at age 37. Upon entering the hospital, he was diagnosed with a form of epilepsy accompanied by acute insanity and hallucinations. The exact nature of his condition has never been determined. Theoretically, Starry Night depicts the view outside his studio window, minus the bars, but there's little correlation between the verdant, unassuming farmland he looked out over in reality and the almost biblical cataclysm in the painting. Partially accounting for its squirming intensity is Van Gogh's method of applying the paint in thick, smeary ribbons, squeezed out like caulking directly from the tube directly onto the canvas. Nestled in the bottom corner is a sleepy village, purely an invention, surrounded by a writhing, heaving landscape that suggests its impending destruction by fire and water. Occupying the center of what's arguably the most recognizable sky in Western art is a swirling galaxy reminiscent of a churning, convulsive whirlpool. The rolling blue mountains rise up, rising up behind the village might just as well be a colossal tidal wave about to engulf its neat little houses, a terrifyingly real possibility in his native Holland. The deep green cypress trees in the foreground, probably another bit of artistic license, are dark tongues of flame. And then there's the stars. Van Gogh's stars aren't twinkling specks of glitter millions of light years away sprinkled across a hazy backdrop of blue-black velvet. They hang oppressively over the earth, 11 enormous suns in the nighttime sky glaring like oncoming headlights through a smashed windshield. Starry Night was all in Van Gogh's mind. Whether it's a work of imagination or hallucination is hard to tell. One thing's for certain, though. The fact that the canvas was executed entirely during the day, in June, in the sun-drenched south of France, no less, is evidence of just how clearly etched in his brain this overpowering vision of devastation was. He considered the work a failure. The image had come too much from his head and not enough from nature. His brother Theo, a pioneering art dealer, and just as importantly, 
the disturbed, perennially destitute artist, lifelong guardian and supporter, agreed it wasn't one of his best, commenting in a letter from October of that year, the search for style takes away the real sentiment of things. Or did gazing inward result in something more telling? Van Gogh, Vincent had written to Theo a year earlier, why, I ask, shouldn't the shining dots of the sky be as accessible as the black dots on the map of France? Just as we take a train to get to Tarascon or Rouen, we take death to reach a star. So that's the end of the reading, but I'm going to add some footnotes. Let me minimize this again so I can see people. Uh, just to fill in some footnotes to clarify the story, uh, in 2009, a book written by German historians Hans Kaufmann and Rita Wildegon speculates that Gauguin cut off Van Gogh's ear with a fencing foil, he was an expert fencer, in self-defense during one of the latter's violent outbursts. A 2011 biography by Stephen Neifa and Gregory White Smith speculates that Van Gogh was shot accidentally by one of two teenage boys from Over who taunted him on a regular basis. Uh, as far as Van Gogh's insanity, Cynthia Saltzman, in her book, Portrait of Dr. Gachet, Story of a Van Gogh Masterpiece, Money, Money, Politics, Collectors, Greed, and Loss, points to a conscious and concerted effort on the part of scholars to de-emphasize Van Gogh's emotional state as having any undue influence on his work. She writes, far from the untutored mental patient whose isolation and failure drove him, drove him to suicide, Van Gogh is reconfigured, reconfigured as an intellectual leader of the post-impressionist generation and an influential figure among the artists who converged on Paris in the 1880s. Well, thank you, Jean. That was, that's that's I the learned reason. so much. I'm sorry? I learned so much. And, oh, thank um, you. That's the point of the book. <laughs> <laughs> also, so if you, well, you as an artist learn something, and that shows that even artists can learn from the book. Tell yeah. You. And, uh, I just wanted to share how inspired I was. I used some pizza table and I made some art based on your book <laughs> and your slideshow. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you can figure out who everybody is. Yeah. Um, I was working on Starry Night. I'm not done, but I just started. Uh, yeah. So well, you can find that real easy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I could. That's only the tip of it. So, yeah, yeah. Nice job. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I think Barb was working on something too, weren't you, Barb? Even as I was speaking, yeah, I couldn't uh, see this happening. <laughs> oh, yeah. We kept this a no, secret from Jean because we, 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 yeah. <laughs> we, we like to be inspired by the art guests. So, oh, that's I, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I like being thought of as inspiring. It does a lot for my little ego. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Guess> himself. <laughs> himself, yeah. So, I, I was thinking about how, like, we were, I, we were just talking about self-portraits, so I was just doing a little bit of a, I don't I know. I like it. I Good start, yeah. Started yeah. doing something. <laughs> <laughs> there are glasses. There are glasses. It's funny. Actually, I kind of like it that way, just as it is. Yeah, oh, I, I was, I think it, it still needs, it needs the blue, the blue streak in the hair, but uh, otherwise. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, no, I see the blue streak. I thought that it's, was. There, oh, there is no blue streak yet. It, there, it needs, Needs to be. No, no, in your I hair. Have, oh, no, right in your, your actual head. head. Your actual head. Bob. Oh, in my hair. Oh, in, in your my actual, actual head. head. Yeah, yeah, oh, right yeah, there. No, it's here. It's a little. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very it's nice. A little bit harder to see in person, or and I mean, in person, it's easier. Oh no, no, I see it now. It's very, very, very obvious now. Yeah, and Jean, um, you've impressed some of our watchers today. They are going to look at Starry Night with a more a different understanding the next time they see it at MoMA. Well, that's the yeah. thing, any, any store, any painting has stories behind it. You know, people think that you just go in and understand art, but you really have to look at art in the context when it was made, because everything has a story behind it. You know, what, why is the artist expressing what they're expressing? You know, why did they do what they do? Well, there's a reason. And you do need a certain amount of education, even, you know, people can understand realistic paintings from, you know, master paintings or whatever, because they say, oh, yeah, that's a port, excuse me, a portrait of so-and-so, whatever, blah, 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 and that's it. But even to understand a portrait like that, you have to know who the person is and mm. what was the 
the background of that person's life. Who is that person? What was their position at court or whatever? Why were they painted? So even if you recognize everything in a painting, you can say how beautifully it's painted or whatever. Mm -hmm. You have to know the story that goes on. Like, who is this person? And what's their story? And what's the time that surrounded them? So that's all education. It is. For instance, do you know why I didn't put your book title? Because we're already looking at art? <laughs> <laughs> because I could, I could have a theory. It doesn't fit, too. <laughs> I thought about that for a moment. And then I thought, you know, I could have a series going, and I don't have to worry about Jean coming after me because I just wrote the word art. <laughs> I didn't oh, write so that. Copyright infringement kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As an artist. I think, I think that constitutes fair use, but I may drag you to court over this. <laughs> you may you may owe me some money. And right now I could use the money because I'm not working a whole lot. Yeah, none of us have any money right now, so I understand. I don't think anybody in the world has any money except for about six people. You know, we're not talking about that. We're avoiding yeah, that. No, I stay happy. We're talking about art. And we're getting right on. Kathina, huh? said, Kathina said she was uh, very inspired by your reading and loves my art. Thank you, Kathina. I want you on the show in the future. Hippie nuts, come on and sing. Anyway, and then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Jean, uh, my mom found your reading to be very interesting. She herself is an artist. So your she mother's had... here? I never met yeah. your mother. <laughs> I, know, I did meet your mother once briefly when I went to your house. Very like, briefly, yeah. Very briefly. And then yeah. they went into, your parents went into another room and left us on our own. That's that's they know what to do. <laughs> Just leave the artists alone. <laughs> Your mother's an artist too. I didn't know that. Yes, she's a painter okay. mostly, but yeah. And then Bart's mom is an artist. Too. My mom is here, and she is also an artist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, my parents were an artist. They were very creative. My mother had a beautiful singing voice, and my oh. father was uh, a tool and die maker, and had to do a lot of very technical kind of drawing. That's hard. Yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah. That was back in the, now that all this stuff was done by computers. But back in the day, he used to work with micrometers and measure things within a thousandth of an inch. Uh, so it was I very wish, demanding work. So he, he had, had an art history too. What was that? I wish we had that instrument on on hand. Well, I can actually Do show you, you something. Yeah, this is actually a tool that my father. Wait, a tool oh, yeah. that my father <laughs> made by hand. It was a prototype for a tool oh, nice. that he oh, made he this made? all by hand. Well, That's I don't amazing. know how to do it. So it's a little like oh, oh it's 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 yeah. It's and he made yeah. this. All this was all hand incised. He did oh, it wow. all by hand. Yeah. My father was an amazing craftsman. So I guess there's, there may be a gene for art. I wonder about that. Oh, I don't know. And yeah. and what did you end up studying at school though? Did you? Why didn't you follow either of their paths or did you just know you were an artist? Well, I went into my original training. I went to Rutgers for theater. I thought I wanted to be an actor at one time, but I had no talent for it. I got a lot of character <laughs> parts. I was kind of funny. I was a good clown, but I wasn't really good at acting, getting in touch with my deep feelings, all that kind of stuff. So I was not cut out to be an actor, but it, the thing is, I think whatever you study is good because that's the reason I can talk in front of people. Like I don't have any hangups talking in front of crowds because I have theater training. Yeah. Mm. So you'd be surprised how things you study in life can inform you in indirect ways. No, I totally agree because um, I, uh, I studied for a while broadcasting for the radio. So I am very, I'm used to sitting around talking to myself. <laughs> it's nice to see you guys. <laughs> I, well, no, I, I know somebody who says that they don't talk to themselves ever, and I always wonder about that. I talk to myself all the time. I was going to say, I do too. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. You don't I, also, I also get made fun of, not in a bad way, but just jokingly, because I talk to my cat Dude. like my cat's a person. Mm -hmm. so I just Did explain they, things they not to do that? I don't know. Yeah. They do not talk to their animal like it's a, another human. Oh, I, I, I'm convinced my cats speak English. I know they do. Or understand English. They don't have, they don't have the, the mouth. They can't move their lips to make the sounds, but I'm sure oh, if they have, I'm sure if you put a little people mouth on my cats, they I can speak I don't think English. my cats understand English, but I think I do. Your cats don't understand English? Oh, interesting. I, I, my cats I remember, don't understand English, but I understand my 
cat. I understand cat, so it works out okay. Oh, okay, that's good. No, they do. They do have their own language. So. You know what's funny about cats, though? They don't. They don't communicate with each other both verbally. They only no. communicate oh, right. with people verbally. Correct. Which mm -hmm. Did they develop vocal cords just from evolution, of hanging out with people? I think, yeah, because I think kittens always had them to call the mama cat. Kittens do. Yeah. Um, but then, evolutionary, they realized, oh, we can get in these people's houses or homes or wherever they're living and demand food from them. If we start <laughs> start annoying them, <laughs> oh. well, they are annoying. Just, yeah. Yeah. I think it's no, no, we're, we're just we're just making them infants still for forever. That cats are still they are still babies. They continue. They have to no be reason babies to, yeah, because they don't. Well, have they don't to have a whole lot to do except you know scratch on That's, furniture, ruin furniture, get hair everywhere. I always find it funny when we go to a foreign country and they see people talking to animals in other languages. It's like, oh wow, your dog speaks French. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <it is. laughs> uh, Jean, you got another comment here. Uh, Angela said she took your six hour art history series and enjoyed it a lot. And now you're gonna buy the book for sure. Oh, so, that's, well done. thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, that, is that Angela Wong? Is no, that, no. Oh. Angela Fiorentino. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm so. Who was it again? Angela? Who? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't hear it. What? Barb has to go. be on the mic. Oh, there you go. Hang on. No, oh, I'm, oh, I'm putting oh, it up. Oh, okay. Wait. There it is. Okay, and I said thank you. It's very gratifying to see it in writing. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, um. Jean, so you're going to hopefully do a book tour. Do you think there'll ever be a second book? I never want to write anything longer than my signature ever again. <laughs> it's just too much work. I enjoyed it, you know, but I never want to write anything again. <laughs> what, a, what about an audio book of this? Would you do an audio book version mm. of the book? Maybe, but I don't know if I, I, I think you really need an actor to do that. Somebody who's really trained. I do know a really great, voiceover artists, a married couple, actually, their names are uh, Eric and Gail, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they, uh, they are a great uh, voiceover artists, professionally trained to do that kind of thing. So I might, if I did, I might request to have them do it, or one of them to do it. I, don't, I would probably stumble over my words too much to do it, so I don't, and I don't have the training. You have to practice, you have to take your time. I don't know how you do it. Well, that's the thing. I found the secret, even though I, I stumbled a couple of times on this reading, but I did pretty well. But you the did. thing I found is the secret is you have to move your lips really big. You have to exaggerate all the sounds because otherwise if you keep your mouth too small, you trip over your words. That's the same for lip syncing. Is it true? Yeah, you have to move your mouth huge, pretending you're saying the words really loudly. <laughs> yeah. But then also crazy. not say them. Well, I'm just a loud Pollock, so my voice carries big anyway. But to not stumble over my words while I'm reading, I have to really exaggerate the sounds big time. So, so yeah. um, what if someone wanted to do a play based on your book? A play? I'm not sure they could do a play based on my book. Oh, like, I have ideas. Play on anything. Yeah. Yeah. Barb and I are doing a play on your book right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, we'll do that. a puppet show of your book. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I got my puppet, my marionette. Marionette is mostly um, sewing spools I've emptied, but yeah, um, Mil Milton be. has no ears, so you know it could be. Uh... I don't know. Our play isn't very good. I guess uh, yeah, we have we have to work on it. <laughs> No, we yeah, work on it, but we are convinced that it can be improv done. class. <laughs> that, that's we need to loosen you up. Take an improv class. Oh yeah, well they're very loose. I think I think you know. Well, they're they're loose, but they they, they have you've got to be able to make stuff up on the spot. You know. Actually, a couple of weeks ago we were very good dancing. Let's see. You got to put your hands together. Walk around. <laughs> Sit down. Can you do well, now I see the whole thing in action. Yeah, yeah. Very clever. Marionetting is a, is a big art form in a lot of countries. 
You yes. know, yeah. in, 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 there's a whole tradition of marionette, marionette shadow puppets in different countries. Mm. In, the Far East and in South Asia. The Japanese shadow puppet, there's a whole tradition of that. So we could do a marionette puppet version of this book in Asia. Is that what you're saying? It would be very popular. <laughs> you never know it's going to fly. You never know. Give it a try. You'll see, you know. Oh, oh, you got one of our Australian viewers, Karen, who's been on the show, really would like to buy the book too. But they may have to wait until they're in the United States again, which they're not going to until this pandemic is over, to purchase your book. So there's a future book order coming. <laughs> I, just saw, I was looking online, and it seems to be, I mean, I did a, van, okay, I did a vanity Google search a couple of days ago, <laughs> and I did see that most English-speaking countries do, like I saw it's for sale in New Zealand. And oh, that's not far. Like there's some book chain in, in Britain, it seems to. I don't know if they're selling it, but they're selling it at least online, or they, they're taking orders for it. Mm. So this one bookstore, I forget what it's called, Brook something or Stone something, or maybe it's Brook Stone or Stone Brook, or I don't remember. Yeah. But I'm they have branches in Scotland and stuff. It's like, it's so cool because I remember one time I did like a, an illustration for a logo for a fashion company, uh, and they were doing a, a trade show of their clothing in Japan. And to think that my art was in Japan, I've never been to Japan, but my art's been to Japan. It's kind of I'm right now, you, you've never been to Japan and any of the other places that people are watching us on this YouTube show now and you later. You have international following on right now? Yeah. I'm, I'm watching. People from Australia are watching right now. We have an international following. You're in Australia. Oh. Uh, we just went through that a couple of shows ago. I forget she's in <laughs> where she is right now because you're asking me on the spot. But I have, a, I have a pen pal from Brisbane. Biz, uh, yeah, Brisbane, as we that's, call it, and they hate it. Yes, yes, that's where she is. Australian, then, we call it Brisbane. Yes, she has a very Brisbane. unique way of saying things that I love. <laughs> oh, and Kath Kathina would love the audiobook to go with hers too. I'm not sure what plans are for an audio. I don't know. We're, I just put it out there. You now have to make an audio book. <laughs> well, maybe if it does well enough, they'll translate into other languages. You know, I have a friend who's getting it in Norway, uh, a guy who did a reading of one of my short stories in Hoboken a while back. This guy, Jonas Marburg, mm -hmm. uh, he's a great actor, and he was in a reading of a short story I did, and he's going to buy it in Norway, but he speaks English, so we don't have to worry about translating it into Norwegian. But I don't know. We have to see how the, the run does. Yeah, it's it's very new, so we don't know. But Barb and I have our fingers crossed for you. What do you do? I do. I have every uh, body crossed. I was gonna say you have your toes crossed, everything, and you yeah. have audience people who who are interested in buying it or have bought it or are about to buy it. So excellent. And then Jean, um, we still have like seven eight minutes, but do you have any parting thoughts about? even the book or art itself or starting a new project. You, like you mentioned earlier about how that time that you and I went to the JCC looking for work and then that evolved into you getting to this book. What part of writing the book where you realized it wasn't just gonna take a year, what, how were you able to motivate yourself to keep going besides needing money <laughs> to keep writing the book? No, well, the thing, I, I just got interested Seriously, and because you mostly, usually with the way it goes, you usually sign a book contract and then you write the book. Mm -hmm. If it's an academic book like this, like a nonfiction book, I mean, this isn't really an academic book, really. It's like mass market academic kind of book. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything in it is true, but it's not like a really academic, academic kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but usually you sign the contrast, contract and then you write the book in like a year or two years, maybe at maximum. Uh, but since I didn't have that kind of deadline, I just, it took on life of its own. And I allowed myself go, to go down rabbit holes. Yeah. So that's what happens. One person told me actually, um, cause I had sent this person uh, a chapter or something to read just because they were curious about it. And she said that I was talking about cabinets of curiosities, which were the, the origin of museums. And I talked about 
Captain Bly from HMS Bounty. She had no idea that Captain Bly was a real person. So that led her into this whole, she spent an hour reading all about pirates, you know, and, and stuff because one thing led to another and that's what I did. <laughs> Barb and I are pirates. In you case said the magic didn't. word. <laughs> you, you really did. You really said the magic word. Uh, my I'm, name I'm, Groucho Marx used to have a, a show on TV called You Bet Your Life, where if you said the magic word, you won 50 bucks. So where's my 50 bucks? Oh, well, it's, it's, in, it's in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's in the mail. Well, the it's in the mail. It might be going to Brisbane. I'm not sure. <laughs> No, so that's the thing about this book. So I went down all these rabbit holes and actually that's where I wound up finding most of the most interesting stuff. And that's why it wound up, I don't mean to sound like, like I'm bragging or anything, but it really is a lot different from, I think any other art book that's ever been written because it just, the way everything it's about, like it covers so much ground and a lot of the information I found out was really weird. You know, and it was only because I had eight years of leisure time to write it that I was able to find out this stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if I had to write it in a year, it could have never happened. It would have been a completely different book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad it took on a life of its own, even though it got really dreary at times. <laughs> no, it did. I'm Especially sure. Especially when it slogged through a really academic painter, paint, uh, paper. Because mm -hmm. like in the whole section about like cave art, I had to read all these things about, you know, different kinds of arrowheads carved out of stone. And all. I see a cat. Yes, you do see yeah. a cat. <laughs> that's all. That's the one who liked my uh, my uh, my cardboard ball so much. Mm. Cardboard globe. Yes. So yeah, that's um. I forget what I was talking about. Oh yeah. So, yeah, because you can't just go to a cave and look at the. Yeah, you know, from, like reading all this stuff about stratum layers, and it's like, I really don't need to know about this. It's kind of interesting, but not really to me. I'm not an archaeologist or an anthropologist, and you know, but I had to slog through all this stuff, you know, and some of the readings were more entertaining. There's a yeah. lot of pop culture stuff. I got to read a lot of trendy magazines. So, can I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to read something else. Okay. I can describe exactly what the book is about. This is the cover blurb. Okay, there are art history books and books on art appreciation. There are essays on creativity, scientific treatises on art and the human brain, and stories in the news about record-breaking art sales. But not until now has anybody put everything you always wanted to about, know about art into one concise, readable, and yes, entertaining read. The Art of Looking at Art examines its subject from every conceivable angle, the philosophical, the functional, and the financial. Discover what goes into making a painting and what goes on in an artist's head. Explore an ancient cave at the tip of Africa where for reasons unknown, our hunter-gatherer ancestors first carved geometric patterns into bits of rock, then pop into New York's high-end auction houses where fortunes are dropped at the raise of a paddle. Learn how to really look at art. The book's lively conversational tone makes the most difficult art comprehensible even for the neophyte. Though this book is for the aficionado too, because as any aficionado will tell you, no matter how much you know about this vast and ever fascinating topic, there's always something new to learn. Any questions, the answer is probably here. So um, in a nutshell, that kind of describes what the book is about. And in a nutshell, how do we get a copy of your book? Oh, well, you just Google the name of the book, which is The Art of Looking at Art. Go full screen. No, oh, full screen. Okay. You're gonna pull yourself up. Hmm? We're looking at your presentation. I thought no, you were gonna the, first, the cover of the book is a few slides back. Okay. Just Google the name of the book or my name, and you'll find it. The name of the publisher is Roman and Littlefield. They're a, a kind of a mainstream academic press located in, in Maryland, mm -hmm. and they put out a lot of really good books. I'm very proud to be publishing with them because they have a really good reputation. So I'm really quite happy about that. I mean, I was kind of stunned and um, that they accepted the book. So you just have to just Google the art of looking at art or my name and it'll crop up at some point. There it is. And your website again. Um, is my name.com. Oh, that's easy. 
my name, M Y N A M E dot com. No, <laughs> that probably yeah. is someone's website. <laughs> no, my name, which you can pronounce either Wisniewski or Wisniewski if you want to get ethnic. Officially, if you want to get, if you want to, you know, pronounce it properly, it's Wisniewski. Oh, thank you. There's, that's my word. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. And you can see my artwork and you can, you know, uh, and I think there's something about the book on it. So, yeah. There, yeah, there might be something about the things that you do. One yeah. Would, well, yeah. Right. One, would, one would hope. One would hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jean, um, thank you for reading. Uh, thank you for sharing your book. Thank you for being on the show. This has been awesome. We'd love to have you back any other time. Uh, we're planning on doing an episode. Yeah, I don't have anything to talk about because I don't do anything. No, else. no, no. We're yeah, having them. <laughs> well, uh, Joshua Howard's going to come back in the future sometime. I don't know when and teach us a dance class. So if you feel like coming on and dancing with us uh, or just being another guest while the main, main person's doing their art and doing some art with us, that would be awesome either way. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully we've attracted some people to your program as well. Yes, yes. And next week uh, we have Bob's, uh, Bar I just named you Bob. I'm sorry, Barb. <laughs> That's okay. Have, it's good all the time. <laughs> <laughs> talking too fast. We, we have Barb's mom on the show. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Making AKA Diane Noren. Diane Noren. Sorry. I, I only That's why. No, uh, she introduces herself as Barbie's mom. <laughs> well, also so, maybe any of the artists out there should contact you if they want to be on your show. Maybe they exactly. Show. That's why I have my at symbol at Amy Bauer Designs. You can hit me up on YouTube or any social media. And I would love to have more people that are watching on the show. I, like I said earlier, Kathina, like the hippie nuts to be on here. That would be awesome. And uh, tune in next week and in the following weeks. And thank you all. Bye. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. See you. Bye. You uh, Bye. do uh, you end this, right?